Well, how have you been going? Uh, fine, fine. Uh, how, how's Amsterdam? How is Amsterdam? Hmm. Quite busy. Uh, more uh, busier than I expected. And, and much busier than last summer when I was here. So, which is a bit odd given that, you know, the weather isn't exactly, you know, conducive. Oh. It's, it's still it's, February, isn't it? It's uh, damn cold. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, surprising number of people. Um, you're certainly in, in, the, in the usual uh, tourist areas, but uh, even in Vondel Park, um, which I'm actually got a hotel right next to um, Vondel Park, which is my favorite place. So, but even that, you know, it's just packed with people, um, and more obviously locals, but uh, nonetheless, it's um, um, they're very busy. So, how come you're back in Europe? Oh, well, that, that's, um, I guess in, in the broadest sense, um, I, I am self-medicating. So I've, I've uh, got situations partly under control in Indonesia, um, but um, there's still a lot of problems there. Um, uh, it is healthy. Ah, you're there. Hello. Hello, Hello Skipper. <laughs> yes. yes. Welcome aboard. Yes. Whoa. <laughs> you, you are, right? You should have a, a whistle. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, only in theory. Um, and in theory, that's most of it. <laughs> oh, well done anyway. That's amazing. Yeah, well, I'm glad it's over, I have to say. Because I, I realized it was the first time I'd done an exam for 47 years, which is. Uh, really? Yeah. It was very yeah. odd. Hmm. Are you proper nervous? <laughs> well, not really. I, um, I think it was fairly straightforward. It was just, uh, I don't know. It was just, it was just a different experience, one that I haven't had for a while. But I, I hmm. never used to be too bothered by exams. Anyway, no, it was a, it was interesting, and it was a very good teacher. He was very, uh, he prompted us a lot, so we, I don't think. He didn't want anybody to fail. So we, were, we were paying him, after all, for his <laughs> teaching. So. <laughs> so he gave useful hints, did he? He, he did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But he was a good teacher. And, and in fact, we covered everything. I, I don't think there would have been a problem, even without his, uh, his assistance. But no, it's, it was, it's been interesting, but it's been, it's been sort of, this last week has, has been quite busy. You know, so I have to revise and things. It's just a very, all these very strange things which I've done for a long time. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, it's good. Now I just have to uh, do a practical. But I think I might wait for a year and do some sailing over the course of the year. Do my... Um, competent crew, get my miles in, and then maybe do it this time next year. Mm. By which time we might have a better idea as to whether we're going to we'll do with boats and things. You know. mm. so my, now that my daughter and a partner have moved down, they both signed up to do the sailing and they, they might get quite mm. involved as well. So. Oh, mm. wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So are you all down there now, both your kids? And then... no, 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 just just Phoebe and Danny and and Marlo, their son, my grandson. Mm. They're they're all here. And uh, no, I don't think Max and Kate will move down. They're, uh, they're Londoners now. They're so. Londoners. 
Well, it is marvelous. Mm. I so enjoyed it yesterday. London is an amazing city. It's really cool. Yeah, we were there a fortnight ago, and uh, because the as, as I mentioned, the courthold is open now, and it's been refurbished. It's been closed for about five years, but it's my favourite gallery, and uh, because it's quite small, but they've just got some extraordinary paintings. So. And they've done it up very nicely. And they've also got this exhibition of uh, Van Gogh self-portraits. So the ones that mainly the ones from Amsterdam, but they've got them from all over the world. It's, wow, that's quite special, isn't it? It's quite it's quite an interesting to see how many he painted a lot of self-portraits because it's cheap and the model stays still which is why anybody does self-portraits. But it was astonishing how over a course of just two years, his style changed so much. I mean, it was a, such a variety and also his mental state because at that time he was, this is the time when he cut his ear off and, and when he was in hospital. And you can see the different, clearly, the different mental states reflected in his painting. But the fact that he was actually able still to paint himself was uh, is, is remarkable. Anyway, it's, it's very, it's a very interesting uh, for mm -hmm. maybe another hour or so. What, what's actually in Wales? What is oh, that? right. It's a, um, there's a, a thing called the Middle Way Society. Mm -hmm. Do you know and, that? And it's, um, run by this guy whose name I've forgotten. Um, but I've got his, I just bought his book. And he, they have just started a retreat. He and his partner have bought a big house in Wales. And they've done it up, or done half of it up. They've got a barn as well, which they haven't yet finished. And the Middle Way, this Middle Way Society is a, an offshoot of uh, Stephen's approach but the bits I've read about them say that they they thought they wanted to go further than Stephen breaking away from from Buddhism as a religion but mu much more following the philosophy of the middle way got him as middle way but looking at it very much from a modern perspective and looking at very much the sort of things that we've been talking about and so I thought I mean they've had zooms and things which I haven't got involved in because I thought it was it's too difficult really to you can't really find out what people are actually talking about unless you've got an opportunity to talk to them sort of face to face so when he said that there's this retreat um i you know people are interested so i just i emailed and said i you know I'll, i'd like to come along it's a it's a weekend one um and it's a it's a themed retreat and this one is about um archetypes and ar archetypes in religion and i so, and he's just written a book which i bought so i'll got to read it um to find out what it's about but it's a, it's effectively i think he's looking at how archetypes um are can be an inspiration without being without people having to get involved in the religious belief aspect of it so it's got a broader appeal to what it is to be a human. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it, and I'm not sure about it. But I'll well, I'll read the book and go on the retreat and find out. But it was for me, it was that wasn't it was just the fact that it was a retreat. It was the first one. Um so I thought I'd I'd go and I'd find out. And I I talked about my drawing uh, exercises and he said, Oh, come along and you could do that as as part of the retreat. So 
that'll be interesting as well. So I'll get an opportunity to present some of the things that I've been doing and see how that reflects on what their thinking is. But as I say, at the moment, I don't know. It's just this sort of, it's a, a striving to find people with similar interests, similar ideas, similar exploration. And I'm not sure whether this will be or, or not, but we'll, we'll see. But uh, mm. I haven't been on a retreat for a long time either, so uh, uh, it seemed uh, an interesting thing to uh, explore. I'll tell you all about it when I've done it and see whether it's... Uh... Yeah, you be scout. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so anyway, that's, that's what... That's what it's about. I, I saw their uh, website a couple of uh, years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, and, it's, um, and, and yeah, it certainly has uh, you know, a, a, a very secular favor. But at that time, I sort of still found it a little bit, you know, there are sort of threads of doctrinaire type of you know, things which obviously have been inherited from um, Buddhist movements. But, you know, it, it seemed to be you know, fairly dynamic. That's my impression. So I doubt whether he is, I hope he's still not fixed in that same position. But, uh, yeah, it, it, did look, it did look interesting. I did like it. Gary, so good to see you. Hey, <laughs> you you are looking unusually yeah. upmarket in your abode <laughs> when you are yeah, in well, Amsterdam. <laughs> Usually, well, it's, it's a cupboard like that a, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm now a, a, a business class hobo. Yes, so, uh, you, know. <laughs> you said so. Yes, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but business class, not not just an ordinary. <laughs> But, but this is only temporary while I'm sort of adjusting to um, everything, like you know, the weather, which really um, being a bit hard on my body. Just just seeing, you know, just trying to keep my eyes open in this cold, just sort of just keep watering up and uh, um, it, it's just, just my whole body is just reacting against um, the, the cold. So uh, I'm, obviously I'm still, you know, acclimatized. I think. So no, we're just look, that, looking that, into the sun. Like the what? sun here is just so damn bright. Um, it's just impossible to see. Um, it's, I think it's because it's so low. The, the, the sun is so low for so much of the time. And you're always looking straight into it as you're walking <laughs> in that direction. Um, and just in... In the, you know, in the in the way that you know, the, the the sun sort of shines on one side of the street and not on the other, and and you have this sudden urge to sort of cross over to the sunny side because you're freezing, uh, you know. And then you're so dazzled. Of, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, then you're dazzled because you can't see where you're going, or or you or you sort of fog up. You either fog up or your eyes are watering uh, from from the cold. So. Yeah, it, it, are they it still doing masks? No. In Dutchland, no? No, no. okay. No. Oh. But they seem to have thought that, you know, we've gone endemic, so that's the new rule. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So was this planned, or did you have to just leave the country pronto again? <laughs> oh, uh, it was certainly planned, but it's sort of planned in a cascading sort of way. It wasn't sort of in a... In a about a particular date, but there was a cascading series of things that had to happen. Um, the last one of which was getting my daughter's um, Australian passport because she was because I was an Australian citizen when she was born. She had to write to get an Australian passport, and so I had to sort of, and that that was a major major hassle just because I had to get you know DNA tests and uh, the embassy was always closed. 
But the embassy there is, the Australian embassy has been effectively closed for two years, which is about how long I've been trying to get her Australian passport. Uh, she wants to go to, well, I want to go to Australia too, so she can stay with uh, my uh, other daughters in Melbourne and get a bit of, um, um, of what, uh, alternative experience um, in terms of uh, you know, her worldview. Because um, she, well, she's been living most of the time with her, her mother in, in, um, in central Java. Um, but her mother is unfortunately, well, um, how can you say this? Um, she does like to get involved in, in rather fringe, radical sort of um, uh, movements, especially those ones which sort of, you know, are Islamic in nature. Um, and at one stage, um, my, my daughter's daughter was actually in a, in a what they call a Pasan train, which is sort of a, an Islamic boarding school, um, you know, wearing the full chadar, you know, you know. So, but yeah, she only lasted about a year there, but, but after then she sort of gravitated back to, 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 to my place in Jakarta. Uh, so, but anyway, so I do want to get her out, um, uh, out of that environment. Um, so, yeah. So, so yeah, so, yeah that, that was one of the cascading things that sort of had to happen. And once it happened, I was out. Uh, but two days, I, I booked my ticket about two days before the flight. So, you know, once that was done, I didn't have to stay there anymore. Uh, plus, there other things which had to happen, which had already happened. Uh, so, I could, you know, I could uh, uh, with, you know, get out you know, while the going was good. And the going's good. <laughs> Take yeah. you. Take the chance. Yeah. How long well, are you yeah. planning to to hang around? Uh, yes, that's a, a good question. Um, um, I guess I guess that the, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, the aspirational answer, I guess, is you know probably a few months. Uh, but uh, anything can happen. Things have already happened. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, to, to the extent that I'm in control of my situation, um, I'm expecting to be here for a little while, at least. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, there's lots of things happening which may well accelerate my return or prevent it. So I've, I've got to see what uh, happens. But my, main, my main priority at the moment is just, um, well, getting to see a doctor, uh, well, or more specifically trying to get insurance uh, to see a doctor. So I've, I've got to go through all this bureaucratic rigmarole, which I'm hoping I can accomplish in Amsterdam or, or Netherlands at least. Um, but yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of bureaucracy before I can even get insurance. So, so yeah, so, so yeah, like I said before with, with Rupert, I, I'm, I'm, my purpose here is just to self-medicate, so in the broader <laughs> sense. <laughs> okay, well, not a bad place for that. <laughs> there are worse places, yes, yes. Although I've been thinking about, you know, I'm actually going to move to Den Haag, uh, maybe uh, this week. Um, hopefully to a cheaper place. Um, um, but yeah, I'll have to see what happens. And then something possibly, something uh, with a basement, please. As, well, as, yeah, the, that, as the Putin is preparing to give us the <laughs> yeah, bomb. A bunker. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Some, some In sort fact, of bunker get thing. out of yeah. Europe if I were you. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so just as I turn up, you know, People I know. Wars. It seems to always happen, you know. I mean, what is it? I mean, is it me? Or is it... <laughs> Trouble follows you around. Well, I, I'm just sort of wondering about that. Is it me following trouble around? 
I mean, it, am I sort of somehow psychologically wired to sort of, you know, look for trouble? No, there's an argument there that, you know, I, mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think I, I do do that, but it does seem that way sometimes. Hmm. So what have you been doing? So why don't you don't involve us? Go to the states or so. If you'd <laughs> if well, trouble, yeah. oh great, yeah, thanks a lot. No, thank you. I'm, I'm going to go to a, you know, a partly civilized country for healthcare. All right. Oh, can we uh, can we uh, uh, ask you that, or is that too too personal? What's up? What's up? What you need a medical treatment? Oh. For? A few things. But the main thing at the moment is my damn uh, back and shoulder and neck and just some sort of orthopedic problem which has just stuck with me and it's just suddenly got worse over the past month or so. Um, so yeah, it's very, very painful. I can usually knock it out with some Panadol and that, that sort of does seem to fix it for a little while. Um, but yeah, it always comes back. So I you know, guess I've got to get a, a, a proper medical opinion um, rather than what I've been dealing with up until now. Mm. So, oh, and a few other things as well. But, but, but basically, I haven't been able to go to Singapore, which is where I do usually do all my medical stuff because it's been you know, obviously closed for the past couple of years. Um, I usually you know, go to Singapore at least uh, once a year just to, to do a complete medical check, blood work, and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, but yeah, I mean, haven't been able to do that at all. And uh, you know, the, the level of uh, medical competence in Indonesia is, is not up to my standard, I guess you could say. So my only option is, well, I had two options. I could go to Australia, but I, I suspect I would just simply die of boredom. Um, uh, truly, uh, but, but uh, so um, yeah, so it's, this is really the next thing, right? so Europe. So, but yeah, I'll have to see whether I can get insurance because you can't do anything here without. I used to just pay for myself, you know, with, you know when I go to Singapore, I just pay out of my own pocket for all, all the things that need doing, you know, whether going to a specialist or whatever. You know, it's expensive, but it's probably as expensive as getting health insurance. Um, but uh, yeah, to get anything in Netherlands, you, you, you just need insurance. They just demand it. So hopefully that bureaucracy can be sorted out. It's quite a process. You've got to get registered with a local council sort of area uh, to get this, this number called a BSN. Once you've got the BSN, then you can open a bank account. Once you open a bank account, you can get health insurance and so on. So it's, but yeah, getting the initial things out of the way, but the, the, the initial bureaucracy might be a bit challenging, but we'll see. But yeah, if, if that doesn't work out, I, I may have to go to England and, and see what's available there. But yeah, that's, uh, well, I'll, I'll see how Amsterdam works out first. Yeah, our health system is struggling here. Mm. I don't know what the private sector is like, but otherwise, mm. my goodness. In what way? Oh, what I... Um, it's, it's, it's like a real... A, so I only I I know from um, what my patients tell me of what they um, experience with the system, and what my doctor friends, my GP friends, tell me, mm -hmm. and it's a bit of a breakdown in in mutual trust. Is it's of, of patient and and doctors. It's mm -hmm. it's it's quite. Alarming sometimes. Well, what what caused that? I think that the doctors are just completely overwhelmed and out of their mind with tiredness and 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 
fatigue and, and yeah mm. and, and and so and stress not just physical tiredness but the stressedness mm. about it a real mm. thing of danger and um so it somehow has gotten into that that patients mean danger personal mm. danger i think mm. in the beginning of the pandemic so many health professionals just died that something happened in in people's minds and mm. um and because the limitations of accessing healthcare in the practice in, in, in GPs was so limited. Um, people's, I think patients fought with anything they had. So they would mislead, they would sometimes lie. I'm sure that's not made up, you know, about their symptoms because they felt they couldn't get uh, appointments otherwise. Mm. And now within the GPs, they feel misled and lied to and so it's, it's a real breakdown of, of that re trusting relationship mm. as if they were against each other uh, instead for of for each other mm. and and people people in hospital getting told i mean that's what people hear like um you are a waste of resources in um I'm sure that no consultant is saying that, but they might say something like, that is a waste of resources, you being in this bed, mm -hmm. because that, that um, something has happened there of uh, bedside manner and so has, has really suffered. So they mm -hmm. might say something like that because they are so stressed out. But how can a patient not hear that as I have wasted valuable resources mm -hmm. and be intensely shamed and then having you know, such a violent reaction against that. So mm -hmm. it, it's things are being said with, on, on both sides, which are most unkind and uncaring and yeah. It's it's it, it's it's a, a bad time. I have to say, mm. I feel for both parties. Both mm. parties are coming out badly here, mm. in the way of how they conduct themselves, and and in the way what what they get done to. Yes, mm. I never had had an experience like this before. Mm. It's almost like if you are a patient, you need an advocate almost to mm. to kind of manage that system mm. and i don't know if you are if if you are a, a doctor you need a holiday i think mm. <laughs> I, i've always wondered what what gets into people's heads that that they want to become doctors i mean it's such a it's to me just a horrible job a really, really horrible job. Not only you don't have to deal with sort of, you know, you know, body fluids and shit and piss and all that sort of stuff, but then you've got to also the, the emotional traumas that go along with, you know, sickness and all that sort of thing. It's just a horrible. Why would anybody want to do that? I've got no idea. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> really, truly, truly, I don't. Maybe, maybe it's just me because it, maybe it's just, just as well that I'm not a doctor. <laughs> because that, that that would not be a, a good thing. So, but then again, I, I've seen plenty of doctors who shouldn't have been doctors. But uh, but yeah, but you know, people who are you know actually really truly aspire to be doctors. Um, that that uh, you know, I'm thankful for, but I'm glad I'm not them. <sighs> so what do you think? Are you worried, you two? Are you worried about those, the state of the world? Yeah, I am. I am. I'm, but I, 
I'm actually more worried by the latest climate change report that came out mm. today. That was quite mm. devastating. Yeah. I haven't heard it yet because I've just been working. Is it, it was, bad? Yeah. Bad it's news. Very bad. Bad. It's it was very bad. blunt. Yeah. It was it's blunt. If mm. effectively there's no chance of keeping the limit to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. And that was always the limit that they were saying that they needed to achieve. But they, you know, they're saying, unless we halve emissions by uh, 2030, then that target won't be met. And there's no way that that's going to happen. That's but kind what, of eight years. <laughs> and then, so, but what the the real problem is, I mean, stuff I sort of knew and sort of put out of my head. But the the real problems are going to come when all those things, which are carbon sinks at the moment, like the frozen tundra and peat bogs, um, become give up their carbon. At the moment, they're taking it in, but when permafrost mm. is no longer permanent and it releases the tundra underneath, then that will give up carbon. And, and when peat bogs dry out, their, their carbon will go. And they are an enormous carbon sink at the moment, and, uh, and which is great when they, when they work. But when they don't work, they're a complete disaster. So it's not that things will get worse. It's things they'll, they'll get beyond the stage where they can never get better and things will get much, much worse. And, and that's within, I can't know, it might be within our lifetime. I mean, you know, never mind all the generations that come after us. So, and then when that happens, I, it's, it's going to make Putin seem like uh, yeah, a walk in the park. So it's and, I, and it's interesting, it comes up on in today and you know it's way down on the list of news items because, mm. quite reasonably because of what's happening. Mm. Um, and that is really weird. But in a, in a way, a lot of the things that, that are happening because of Putin are, are actually, I mean, it's bizarre to say it, but I actually think that they, the, the outcomes could be quite positive. The fact that Putin is on his own in, in Russia. In the past, he would have been part of the Politburo and he would have been part of the Soviet Union. And so there would have been an obvious line of succession and there would have been people ready to take over. The next person would have been there. But that isn't there anymore. There is just now a czar, but a czar without a, the royal family. And when he goes, and I, I, I be interesting to see how, how he goes, but, but I, I, I could see a complete collapse then of the current Russian, which is a sort of the end of the, 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 so the Soviet era. Because Russians clearly don't want to be part of this. It's not Russia that is fighting the war. It's Putin who's fighting the war. Mm -hmm. So Russians are like the Ukrainians. They're thinking, this is crazy. Why would we want to be involved in this? And, and there isn't the societal structure underneath Putin, which is supporting him. And I suspect the, one of the reasons they're not doing very well is because the army aren't supporting him. I mean, the common soldier, I mean, these are just boys, young men, who have been told to go and fight and kill people who until very recently were their brothers. This is like the French killing Belgians or the Germans killing the Dutch. It's just not, you know, they're mates. You just don't, it's just make, it makes no sense. And there is no, so, you know, with a lot of, 
whether it's true or not, but there are a lot of reports in the Ukraine of people saying, soldiers saying, well, as soon as we see Russians close up, they just surrender. Because well, why would they want to keep shooting? So if from a distance, you can shoot people, but not when you see them face to face. And the Russians, are, you know, the Russian army is not, well, what's its motivation? Other than you're a soldier. Whereas the Ukrainians have got, you know, it's their country that's being invaded. So they have an enormous motivation. And so I think on one side, I think this could be the end of, of Russia as we've known it as a sort of Soviet enterprise. And the other thing is, it's amazing how unified the Western countries, particularly in, in Europe, have been, but also, I mean, there's the States as well. And in a way, the, the UK is an outlier now. It's, it's the EU, which is giving half a billion pounds worth of aid to the Ukraine. It's the EU who's taking in all refugees, saying you've got status within European countries mm. for three years. It's just amazing that that's within a week that's happened. And Germany saying that we're now going to give arms to Ukraine. Um, and that we're going to ban SWIFT, and that we're going to uh, ban the pipeline. I mean, I can't know what <laughs> like for your friends and family in, in, in Germany, Elfie, but I mean, it's the, the impact, the economic impact on Germany is going to be tremendous. And uh, Italy, Italy gets most of its energy from Russia. And it's now said, well, we're, we're gonna ban the, the SWIFT payments. So, it's, it's an extraordinary thing to do. And the, the hardship for those countries is going to be amazing. But the fact that they've done it, that they've said, no, this is, this is you know, it's, it's not in NATO, it's not in the EU, but it's a, it's a country and we're close by and we, we will support you. So I think that that unification within a, within a week it's just extraordinary. And I was reading one article today so that this might well be the big surprise for Putin because he he expected to divide and rule like he always has done in the past. And, but even Hungary, even Turkey, I've, I've now gone against it. Even Switzerland, apparently, are now saying that they're going to uh, ban financial arrangements with Russia, which is like completely unheard of. You know, one of the, the reasons I think that was, like that sudden shift, although, you know, I think, you know, even, even, I think there's plenty of, there seemed to be plenty of sympathy in, in Germany in the last week, for example, but, you know, obviously they've got constraints. But I think what really tipped it was, was the fact that the Ukrainians started fighting and people started thinking, well, if they're prepared to fight, we're prepared to back them. I think that might have been an element in, in uh, the political uh, turnabout was, was the, the resolve that they showed. So, you know, they're thinking that, you know, if they're prepared to fight, then we're prepared to back them. Well, I think, I, I think yeah, that might I mean, have been an element. Yeah, it might well be. And the fact that their president is just extraordinary. I mean, it was, <laughs> mm -hmm. three years ago, he was an actor and a comedian. And he's now become <laughs> the president. Uh, and he, he, he wasn't doing very well, apparently, just recently, because he had lots of economic problems and so on. And they, they felt that there was an appeasement towards what Putin had done in the east of the Ukraine. But he's just turned around. And I, and I read somewhere that they think you know, he must have some very good script writers, uh, the people who write his, his, um, his speeches. And of course, he's an actor, so he is very mm -hmm. good at presenting himself and presenting to the world um, what it's like. And the fact that he said, "Well, yeah, you know, you've got to. I mean, if you invade us, you're not going to see our backs; you'll see our faces." And he says to the Americans that, "I don't want to ride; I want ammunition." So yeah, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think he's led this idea of defiance. And, and he's mm -hmm. so European, he's so yes. young, he's, he's, he's well spoken, he's not very articulate, but he doesn't dress in suits, he just, he's, he's 
relaxed and he uses a, a smartphone to selfies and he's obviously somebody who it could be you, know, you probably prefer him to to macron as your president you know you're thinking oh, if you're mm. if you're a westerner so you think yeah so this is he's actually a westerner he's one of us so yeah i think you're probably mm -hmm. right it's the fact that this isn't mm. The Ukraine, which I didn't know much about, I know an awful lot more about it now, has appears to be a, a sort of Central European country. Mm -hmm. That's the, mm -hmm. the impression that's been given. And apparently he just, he phones all the presidents and prime ministers of, the, of Europe all day long. He's just on the boat <laughs> constantly pestering mm -hmm. and saying, we want this, we want that. We want that. And it, it, it is he, and there must be, a, I mean, look, people behind him have just worked out the strategy. This is what you've got to do. Um, I just pester, pester, and use social media to get your message across. But it's amazing. It, whatever, however it's happened, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's astonishing. You know, well, people talk about comedians, I mean, and, and this, it keeps getting mentioned, but you know, comedians, are, are, especially nowadays, are, are effectively social critics. Uh, and they're, they're often very intelligent. You, very you intelligent. You have to be yes, very yes. intelligent to pull off a, 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 a. And you have to be quick thinking yes, too, exactly. don't you? And mm. a bit out of the box, otherwise you can't make it yeah. funny. Yeah. So it's exactly. it, there's a lot of philosophy in a mm -hmm. comedian, I think. Yeah, and, I think and, so. and and you know what it is like to be heckled. Mm. So you, you 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 have some experience of of indeed standing there in front of a crowd mm. and and being quite composed in that way. Mm. And I mm. I think mm. you would have that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So he certainly he doesn't suffer from stage fright. Well, he's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 it's just whatever happened, whatever it is. It's I think the overall effect is is. Is very positive if you can be very positive given this situation but there is no but also but biden god bless him i mean it's been very good i mean he has been i mean i liked the american approach which was to say beforehand this is this is what they're going what the russians are going to do they're going to, on wednesday they're going to invade you think what well, yeah he said yeah look here there's a satellite pictures they're showing you all this information which in the past would have been top secret and everything no, I'll just put it all out there. You know, look, let's just see what's going on. And that complete mm -hmm. turnaround in the way that, 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 that this has been presented as a as a war. It's not being hidden away. And it's not the Secret Service. It's like, you yeah, well, the Secret Service, but with, with, all the secrets are coming out. Like, we'll show you what's going on. And it works. I mean, it, the impact has mm -hmm. been... Uh, amazing and the response has been amazing and i think i think you're right a lot of it has been the fact that the ukrainians have looked defiant and mm. it, people for, you, know, you sort of respond you think you know that's me and i'm thinking well i'm 65 so i, I would i have to fight you know up to 60 you have to you're not allowed to leave the country mm. yeah but would i and i think well yeah, I probably would. I probably would. They wouldn't want me. Mind you, I've got my skipper's no. license now, so I might be, yeah, I might be exactly. handy for that. You know? exactly. I'll sail a boat, theoretically. you fight them on the waves. <laughs> but then I, I find it, so in that way, oddly encouraging. It must be so odd for, for Putin, you know, because I think he had a, a very mm. personal hate of Selenkin, the the because he thought, how can a, a jester, a, a fool, mm -hmm. you know, be my opponent? I think for for Putin that was almost um, an insult that he would mm -hmm. have to deal with someone like that, you know, big Putin and this fool. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it must be a a really a, a, a very startling experience for him what's happening there and how this fool is actually pulling it off because mm -hmm. I, I i think that he would make mincemeat of him within one day you know he would have the tail between the legs and mm -hmm. leg it to somewhere um safe 
It it must be all pretty surprising to Putin if he gets mm -hmm. that information. Yeah. Well, there's been lots of talk about him, you know, sort of being surrounded by sycophants and uh, and and yes men and all that, and that that seems to have happened. I mean, it, the, the, I guess it's the Napoleon complex, you know, it, it just with increasing power, he's increasingly remote, and they, and they can't even see it. They can't see what's happening to themselves. No. Uh, that, that, that they're losing touch. That that they're just not. Uh, evaluating situations as they should be. He just made so much a, a terrible mistake. The problem is that to get out of it, you know. So do you think yeah. all these uh, uh, sanctions and all that, actually, the, the hope would be that we do it all like, uh, you know, we do it differently, not softly, softly, so we don't suffer mm -hmm. too much in the long run, but to do it completely um, massively in the in the uh, outlook that actually it won't last that long because mm. Putin will get unsettled. He will mm. leave. And then you oh. can just stop all the sanctions again. So, you know, you don't have to give up your pipeline for good, just temporarily, just for a mm. short while until the guy is gone. I think that could be one tactic that's playing out here mm. yeah i think uh, the thing is there has to be an escape route for putin I, there isn't there isn't well but there has death. to be well I, it's either de death is the is the only thing is and that you you just think that there are those people who are close to him, physically close to him and they must be thinking hang on this is getting a bit ridiculous now nuclear weapons that, that's you know that, that this is no future. There's no sustainable future here. And there's only one person that's causing the problem. And there, I mean, the you know, Second World War, there were two assassination attempts on, on Hitler, and they were by people close to him. So, I mean, this is all much faster. But you think, if you were in their position, you'd be thinking, you know, what's, there's an easy way out of this. Mm. And if if I was an American, <laughs> if I was if I was Biden, I'd be saying, just go and talk to some of those guys and tell them, you know, we'll, we'll make you a billionaire. You know, you will we'll, man, we'll make sure that you're a hero and you're safe, and we'll give you all sorts of whatever you want. If, if there's just one person just disappears, it'd be great. And then I would just put it on social media as well. I just say, we've told these guys that they should be doing this, you know, and they be thinking, and then beauty will go mad because, oh no, you're, you know, get really paranoid. Let's see. So as mind, you know, mindful people on the path, what would, what do we think about such things as assassination? What's the well, morals not... of that? What's our ethical stance? Well, I, I think that there are some there's some times like the Eskimos where you push them off the iceberg, and that's what we, that's what we've always done. We've it's how we've resolved problems which were otherwise unresolvable. We don't have a way of of mediating this, and and this is the the trolley problem writ large, isn't it? You've got five people on the tracks. Do you divert the trolley to kill one person to save five? In this case, it's you kill one person to save thousands. Um, mm. So, no, I don't, wouldn't have any problem. Mm. I'm sorry. I, but, I, I, means that, but it does come to a, to a judgment about at what point a, a person stops being human. At what point a, a person becomes you know, so dehumanized that they've, they've been speciated, that they become other, uh, at which point you can say they are no longer one of us. They are, they are another species. We can kill them. And, and that's the way people have often thought. Um, and the speciation is, is deeply embedded in, 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 in primates. And, uh, you know, you know, that this, so, so, you know, that this tribal nature is, is 
is all, almost a form of speciation, being, being sort of you know, a, a member of one tribe as opposed to another is, is not just a movement of you know, one species to another species, but it's actually a, a process of otherness that, that you, know, you, you speciate the other tribe uh, and basically turn them into animals in order to kill them. Uh, and, and I think that that's what you know, people do in these situations. They, they sort of look at this, this brute, this, this, this murderous bully, uh, and collectively decide this person is lo no longer human. This person is no longer one of us. He, he must be removed. And that is you know, a very common occurrence in, in certainly now my study of anthropology, but, but you know, in history as well. Um, it's like interesting that, that there was a, uh, in our time, I recommend it highly, they did a, a thing on Kropotkin. I've never heard of oh, the yeah. guy before. Peter, Peter Kropotkin, yes, the prince. Kropotkin. The Russian prince. Yes, yeah. the Russian prince R R who, who was an anarchist. I don't know anything mm -hmm. about anarchy either. Yeah. That's why I was asking a mm -hmm. lesson. Because I think for the first time I get you in that, because you mentioned anarchy before, and I I just didn't know enough about it to to appreciate that. Um, but they, they, so in this in this radio show about him, they so he developed this thing about mutual aid. So mutual aid means you know we we actually self organize just like most animals do. We self organize for and and even across species. And to our mutual benefit much more often than that we kill each other. So that I think was his observation. He was a naturalist as well. And, and that was his observation. And in that, I don't think it was his uh, observation, but um, the philosophers that were discussing him then um, said something like you just mentioned that actually the, there is um, in the animal studies, you can you can see this mutual aid within a tribe or, or any mm -hmm. group of mammals. And it's all about, you know, you rub my back, I rub yours. And there's, that's mm -hmm. all going on within the group. Uh, and when, when it happens that one individual is really, um, so that it would be initiated by one individual who take themselves out of that mutual agreement almost of this aiding one another and gets truly selfish in that way mm -hmm. and would stop doing things and just exploit suddenly the rest of the tribe would go co together against this one individual and kill it mm -hmm. so yeah. you have you have violated the most priority rule of mutual aid and being mm -hmm. kind and and aiding your fellows, and when you are so, uh, when you when you um, harming that principle too much, uh, the, the, suddenly the whole tribe gets ruthless, mm -hmm. and and kills that individual. Yeah. And and that's just what you said, actually, isn't it? That's what they mm. also mentioned. Mm. Yeah. Well, it certainly happens in a lot of tribes that you know people people perhaps assume that you know that the you know people living tribal traditional lives are you know, very non-violent and cooperative, but you know that there emerges psychopaths even in tribal societies, and uh, and uh, that they can sometimes be dealt with in, in a deadly manner. Uh, without anybody really caring or, or reporting it, you know, it's just uh, you know, it's done collectively. You know? um, so, which is you know pretty scary in some ways. In other ways, uh, completely understandable when you see, you know, some of the psychopathic humans that can can emerge, uh, who are extremely, you know, destructive, and violent. Um, and who and, and and whose only solution is is their removal. Um, and you know, I think you know, and that, that's obviously that seems to be the case in in so many situations in so many nation states in particular. Um, you know, where, where where the only way the only way to to get rid of a dictator is to kill them, and there's really no other way of doing it. 
Before yeah, he puts the finger on the button. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that is a problem. Yes, that's an issue. Rupert. Yeah, I, I, I read something uh, what's a long time ago, but and it was about individuals as opposed to um, societies when it comes to most, not most, but some conflicts. So you can have some conflicts where there is animosity between two cultures, and that creates the problem. But you can have some cult, some conflicts like. So perhaps the difference between the First World War and the Second World War, because in the First World War, there were a lot of underlying issues which created the tensions, the, the conditions for a world war. But in the Second World War, there was Hitler. There was an in one individual. And that, I can't remember what it was, but the, 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 the point that they were making was that occasionally it is just an individual and the removal of that individual stops everything. The removal of one individual in the First World War wouldn't have made any difference. There was no head of state anywhere that you could take one person out and the war would have ended. But there was in the Second World War. There was only one person who was who made it happen and continued to make it happen. And taking one person out in that situation does change things and therefore and so from a from a philosophical perspective it would become justifiable to do that if there was no other way of constraining that individual if you can't capture them if you can't that that was possible then that the sensible thing to do is to remove that individual and i think that's the case here i think that's what you've got with putin you've not whereas i don't think it was the case within the soviet union before when you had the politburo and you had a succession you had mm. an obvious lineup you knew who was going to come next or they knew or whatever you know, it was like more like popes and cardinals you know there was a system and there isn't that now you have just one person who's like he's like the last czar and and he's become he's become power crazed but so removing that one person stops everything. There would be no invasion. There is no, Russia would not invade. Russia has not invaded. And in fact, it was a head of uh, the UN or, or EU or somebody who was talking about this today. And he was saying, I'm so, I'll, he said, yeah, Russia invaded. And I said, I correct myself, Putin invaded. Russians did not. The Russian people did not invade. The Russians did not want this. This is Putin. And it, and he was really good, and he was, he was a Spanish chap, and he was the one who was talking about all the sanctions. But he was saying, no, this is one person that's doing this, and it is. So I, I, I guess, really, yeah, you, it's reasonable to remove that one person. So, uh, how, what would you say if I said, this is the death throes of the nation state, like the power being within one nation, you know, Putin being like a 20th century proponent of this, you know, not of our century anymore. He's like a dinosaur and he hasn't quite gotten it yet that he's the dying one. But the threat, death threat thrashes might be really quite something um, because in it, what what surely then is it surely I say is it that the next power where power will live is not within governments and nation states but within um, the, the the media, the, the the cyberspace, the Zuckerbergs, the Bezoses, the the people who have those much more global um, um, entities uh, under their control. They don't care about nation states much. They circumvent them wherever they can, like paying taxes and stuff like that. So. They could be anywhere. They don't. That it's it's um, it's where where the power will get and where where those things or who gets what will get settled in the future. So um, and 
uh, there's a hopeful twist in that because if I think that through, um, and they are they are a bit more anarchic, aren't they? They don't believe even in big state, you know. They they feel like self organization much more because that's how they do it. They 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 really question that. So something you know, that if some some followers of those things would have been very much for Brexit because they don't like big organization political organizations like um, mm. the EU. So they they would be about much more local organized uh, citizenship and all that as i understand it then within that global networking of those superpowers which are not national they have nothing to do with that um, but they would now look at someone like putin and say mate you are not mess messing with my world i like my life in Silicon Valley very much. And you are going to drop a bomb on, on my life? I don't think so, mate. And they would have even the power because they have all the, the, um, they have the media, but they also have the cyberspace, the, the kind, you know, they have the hackers to get into the Kremlin and just make the buttons not work. If you get me, you know, they they would be able to completely foil, you know, you know, you're not launching a missile, darling, because mm -hmm. you need my GPS for it. And I'm, I got the uh, I got the switch right here, <laughs> that kind of thing, which would mean that these guys, if they're not already talking to each other, I think they're missing a trick and they should. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have every hope that they are already planning how to take Putin out in a very technical way. Well, there's a, Your there's opinion, a few, please. There's a few problems there. I mean, but Facebook and Google and all the rest of them, um, they do not have a monopoly on the use of force. Okay, so, so that, that makes them significantly different organizations compared to nation states. So that's, that's number one. But, but, but you know, I, I think, you know, the, to knock that, that system out, so to knock, you know, you know, hackers and Facebook and all, all the, the other platforms out of the picture is not that difficult. All you have to do is turn off the electricity and blow up the satellites. And they've already done that. Uh, last year, if you remember, uh, there was a, a test by, by you know, with a, a, a Russian um, rocket. That they, they sent up a rocket and blew up one of their old satellites, and in the process caused a, a massive um, pile of space junk to, 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 you know, to, to, to circulate in, in, in low Earth orbit. Uh, and I, I don't know whether actually they took out other um, satellites, but they certainly have bits of it did hit the, the International Space Station, for example. Uh, but, but you know th that was a test, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind putting a bit of money on, on the fact that that, uh, that Putin might well send up rockets in order to destroy the, the satellite uh, network. Um, the, he had a, a meeting uh, yesterday, or he, he went to a visit to to. Um, some sort of space center yesterday, which is a bit of a bit of an odd place to go to in the middle of a war. Uh, in the why you're going to this, to, to this uh, launch center and looking at your rockets. Um, th these rockets were you know, space rockets; they weren't sort of you know uh, missiles. Um, and and uh, you know one reason for that might have been that it would have been a, even on the same day I think it was that Elon Musk declared that those Starlink satellites, those low, low Earth orbit satellites, of, which has got thousands circulating the, the Earth at the moment, that he would activate uh, the uh, uh, Ukraine um, for, for access to those satellites. So it basically means that you know, anybody anywhere in the Ukraine with, with, with uh, um, a dish could get high speed internet, a very high speed internet. Um, you know, from wherever they are, and not reliant upon any other infrastructure. 
So the way to take that out is, is to you know, send up a rocket and, and, and create lots of space junk. And, uh, and that's what they tested last, I think it was last uh, November or something. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, in, in order for a hacker to be able to do their work, you know, in the absence of not having a monopoly on the, on the, on the use of uh, deadly force, uh, you just turn off the electricity and blow up the internet. And that's, and that's what Putin could do. But then he could also not use it for his own missiles. Is that true? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, they, they, these are only low Earth orbit um, satellites, but these are satellites which could give a, you know, make a huge difference to, to communications within, within Ukraine, within all countries, actually. Uh, it, it could be, you know, it, it's, um, it's going to be revolutionary once all the satellites get up. But, uh, you know, like the, Putin has already, do, already done last year, you know, set, they, they were basically practicing blowing up satellites in order to cause, um, uh, you know, huge amounts of space junk in order to destroy other, other satellites in that orbit. So... It wouldn't surprise me if he did that, um, even now. You know, that that would be a because you know, I mean, if you have Elon Musk basically saying here, here, Ukraine, you, you've got high speed internet anywhere in Ukraine. Um, you know, all of a sudden, all the the communications problems are are over. You know, they've got you know they they probably have better communications than than, than the Russian military. So it would. Uh, it would make sense, I think. You know, I, I think what, one of the things which could uh, Putin could use to to um, up the ante would be an attack on on um, our satellite systems. Um, if I was Putin, I, I, that's what I'd tell him to do. This is what you've got to do: block the satellites. Uh, it's a, it depends <laughs> whose satellites they are, because it that, doesn't matter. It doesn't well, it matter. does. It, from a point of well, view of of war, it matters. At the moment, mm -hmm. he's attacking a country which is not in NATO, and and every and NATO is very careful to make sure that whilst it will supply arms, it won't supply people. It's not going to have a war with Russia. But if mm -hmm. if Russia invades another country, a NATO country, that's all-out war. Then, mm -hmm. and if it depends if he, if he if he attacks. NATO property in space, then it, it could be this is a declaration of war. So it, it's, I, I suspect he'd have to think carefully about it. And also, it's, it's not, I can see, yes, it's a possibility, but space is a big place. And to have enough debris to get all of the new satellites that they're going, is, you'd, have to be, you'd have to be pretty good at it, and I. I, it's possible, but I, I suspect that's it's, it's we'll see. We'll see. We're, you just said we'll have, we'll have a wager on it. I, I, well, I, we can I, have a swoop six. <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to. But uh, to answer your first question, Selfie, I, I don't think this is the end of city of, of, of nation states, I, but I do think it's the end of empire. I think this is the end of the Russian empire. And because that's what Putin wants, he wants. <clears throat> to restore the empire, and he, he's, it's not going to happen. It's um, that, that's and and I think it will. It could well be the end. You know? So the only empire left might. I don't know whether China considers itself an empire. I would think it's well, China is a problem. If if Putin gets away with this, the Southeast uh, Asia is next. Yeah, uh, isn't it? That, uh, not just Taiwan, but the, the entire Southeast, uh, um, South China Sea, and all the countries. Are well, joining. maybe that's another reason why this unity of the West is so uh, important. Um, yes, yeah. Because this is it. It's it, it's it's heartening. Anyway, the response has been heartening. I'm surprised at the mm. response. But I'm heartened by it because it, it is, you know, this is creating hardship for countries which otherwise don't need to get involved, mm -hmm. but they've got involved. 
and they've yeah. created hardship for themselves and for their for the you know the, their voters and these are democracies mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's uh, my fuel bill went up by 75 percent yesterday and wow. it, mm -hmm. and it'll go up again now you know because of this mm -hmm. it's going to get worse mm -hmm. and i i can afford to pay it but there's a hell of a lot of people who are going to find it very difficult um, mm -hmm. and uh yeah i and uh, but uh, that's just in Britain. Uh, Britain only takes about five percent of its energy from Russia. Italy's main supplier of energy is Russia, mm -hmm. and they have committed to to all of the sanctions as part of mm -hmm. the EU. Really, I mean, that's I guess that's what it's come down to: is that the EU needed to be to show solidarity. But I think what Italy and what Germany have done, particularly, has been quite astonishing. Mm -hmm. It's a big, a big sacrifice. It's a huge, yeah, it's huge, mm -hmm. and and for quite a long time, it's going to be make life very mm -hmm. difficult. But it's a hell of a lot worse worse for the Ukrainians, and very, it's going to be very difficult for Russians. I mean, the, yeah. remember what it was like after the crash, you know, and people queuing up for the the banks mm -hmm. and things. Well, yeah. Imagine what that's going to be like in Russia. I mean, it's like. It's it will it's 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 just gonna be a start. I mean, what if if it gets so clear that it all hangs on one person only, really? Then because as soon as as soon as he would be gone, everything would be changed, wouldn't it? And everything, sanctions, um, trading, everything just stop. Yeah, it, would all, it would all overnight. Everything overnight. Yeah. It, yeah. It, yeah. And you just know, keep, if, Russians and go home. Keeps, uh, everybody everyone, keeps making that point, and uh, maybe somebody will think. Oh. And maybe someone has the opportunity and inclination. And they certainly got the weapons. I mean, they are generals after all. Right? Mm. They should maybe, be good at it. Maybe we should do a crowdfunder. Yeah, for, for, yeah. For well, an assassination well, attempt. Well, I don't know. If, 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 if I'm saying, I think Biden really ought to just be saying to them, "Well, look, you know, he doesn't need. To, he's got plenty of money. Mm -hmm. We could make life very, very, very pleasant for you. Mm -hmm. You could be the greatest hero in the 21st century." Because mm -hmm. in the end, it's very difficult to safeguard yourself from that kind of thing. Yeah, because uh, yeah. so you. You have your militia there to disarm everyone who comes into your vicinity, but they need arms for that. <laughs> so it's it's like a Russian doll. It is, it is, it's the next layer yeah. that might have the um, the disloyal person in it. So you cannot really mm. safeguard yourself as a single person from assassination in that way, mm. and. It's usually the bodyguards, isn't it? That's kind oh, of wow. yeah. as they say. Yeah. yeah. Huh. That um, thing from the Middle Way Society. Yeah. It says the Middle Way Society was founded to promote the study and practice of the Middle Way. The Middle Way is the idea that we make better judgments by avoiding fixed beliefs and being open to practical experience. We challenge unhelpful distinctions between fact and values, reason and emotion, religion and secularism, or arts and sciences. Though our name is inspired by some of the insights of the Buddha, we are independent of Buddhism or any other religion. We seek to promote and support integrative practice, overcoming conflict of all kinds. So yeah, it's, a, it's a very much a sort of it's actually and the patrons are Ian McGilchrist and Stephen Batchelor, so it's obviously a a spin off from uh, mm. Stephen's approach. But I'm sure I read somewhere that they they weren't quite I didn't see them completely aligned with what Stephen was doing. Mm. That's a sort of bit yeah. of offshoot. But anyway, we're yeah. off. No doubt. Yeah, I think it'd be, be interesting to to see what he's up to. I mean, cause yeah. it, I mean, I think you know. In one way, you could say that you know what he's what he's doing is trying to define the Dharma, but uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but why not? Um, 
uh, I think it, it, it's, it's a good endeavor. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sort of, I was, I was intrigued, interested, so I thought I'd go. Mm. I'll, uh, but it's a, it's a long book. I said, God, it's, so, mm -hmm. yeah, the book is, it's, a, it's, it's called. Archetypes in Religion and Beyond, a practical theory of human integration and inspiration. But it's like this, big, mm -hmm. lots of words. Uh, too many words. So I've got to whiz, I've only got 10 days, I've got to work, whiz through it. So what happened, Elfie? What's happened? I'm. I don't know. I lost you. Lost. It yeah, seemed, you yeah, don't cut off. But I'm back. It was probably yeah. the Russians. Yeah. It's, I think uh, they. Someone was on to me there. <laughs> I must have yeah, said something so. sensible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Cool. Gilchrist, is that the? Is is that the? Um, empathy guy. No. No, no, Gilbert. He, no, no, no. Gilchrist. Ian Gilchrist, his name is. I don't know. Never heard of him. But he and Stephen Batchelor, so I don't know. But I, I've not heard him come up in a Stephen forum. I don't think he's a, in the Bodhi College. But, I, I think it may well predate uh, Bodhi College. No, uh, if, yeah. that, if that's my memory serves me. Um, so he, he may have had some contact with Stephen before the body college got established and uh, has sort of been doing it since since then. Uh, mm. Well, it'd be interesting. I mean, uh, archetypes, mentioning of that always makes me think of Jungian staff, of course. Mm. Yeah, well, he talks about that, but he, he, he's, he's interested, he says, in the Jungian, arc, the idea of the archetype, but not his, um, what is it, uh, shared uh, memories, shared, uh, I, I can't remember. But there are, he likes part of the idea of archetype, but not. Uh, anyway, I'll find out more whenever I read this book, so... Uh, But then he said, "Well, maybe I could do the when I did the drawing thing. Maybe I could relate relate that to the theme of the of the retreat." And I was thinking, oh, I don't, I'm "Not sure, I'm not sure how I can uh -huh. how I can fit that in." But we'll see. But, uh, other than I said that mm. because it was to do with nature, because we tended to draw things which are nature. Maybe you could consider nature itself an archetype. But I think that's probably too broad an idea. Mm. We'll see. That'd be interesting anyway, and how they do it, how how even the setup is, you know, how much yeah. time yeah. on the cushion, um, you know, how do, how do they do well, it? Well, I hope, I hope there'll be enough time to have a general discussion so that I can find out um, you know, more about what their approach is. And, uh, mm. See if there's any... Mm. Yeah. Hey, and we can mm -hmm. we can zoom with Gary and hear all mm -hmm. about it. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, who, who knows? I may, may even drop over. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's uh, don't know yet. I uh, have to see. But, False promises. <laughs> well, I, I sort of have been having an intention to go to to England for for a while. Um, I guess mainly to sort of satiate my obsession with um, narrow boats, uh, but but apart from that, um, there's yeah, interesting things going on in in um, I guess what would you call it the alternative space in terms of uh, you know that the, 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 there seems to be a a, a, a a new back to the land push. Um, and, and people sort of buying uh, rural properties and uh, 
are, are going self-sufficient. You know, like like they used to do in the 70s, the early 70s. So, you know, yeah, it's just interesting um, movements and things happening uh, in, in, well, not just in England, but, but that's what I've been mainly looking at. And so, and, and Wales, a lot, a lot of people looking at Wales for that for some reason. It's cheap, that's why. Yes, uh -huh. it's the only well, place where you can afford a farmstead. <laughs> only place, yeah, where it's affordable. And it's not under snow most of the time. <laughs> Oh, no, just rain okay. though. It rains a lot in Wales. Lots it rains rain. a lot, but okay. it's not okay. like Scotland's freezing. <laughs> yeah. So you're freezing and wet. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> just we... the environment for you. <laughs> yeah. Just you just yeah. will. We we get you goggles, Gary, so that you can <laughs> yeah. actually go out. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So do you, we have to talk another time, but do you see that this new, the, the, the new cyber industry in that way? What can I, I have no word for it really. All this kind of, you know, the, the, um, the people who work globally on, on, you know, those, those people who are the big movers in, in cyberspace that mm -hmm. they have an, an, an anarchic political outlook? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There he says, oh, yeah. absolutely. Oh, OK, oh, yeah. it took me a while. Don't make so little of it. <laughs> the, 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 the whole open source movement is based on anarchy. Um, and, you know, and, and, and the vast majority of the, those big platforms, Google, Facebook in particular, they're nearly 100% open source. All, you know, all their platforms that are built using open source software. Uh, they and they grew up out of that open source group. It was just an assumption that you know, everybody knew that it's open source. It really wasn't a big deal. It's what you do with it that really sort of counts in terms of you know, making money. Uh, but, but yeah, they, they come from that same culture. Mm. I really have to kind of read up about this. <laughs> Listen to the, oh God. Um, yeah. So do you know this book, The Sovereign Individual? The Sovereign Individual. Well, I'm not sure that that's an anarchist book. There is a, a bit of a, a divide here. In, in America, they, they there's a, a group calling themselves libertarian, um, and invariably the 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 right wing shits, you know, they're just uh, selfish right wing bastards, uh, and that's what they call libertarianism. But what, libertarianism in 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 um, well certainly in, in England and Europe and and certainly in Australia and New Zealand, it was exactly the opposite. Today, it's libertarian, you're talking about leftist libertarianism not talking about the right wing, but that stuff all gets rather mixed up as, as you know, so-called anarchism. And so you sort of have these you know, right wing people running about claiming they're anarchists where they're, where they're really just sort of, you know, well, fascist, to, 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 to put it briefly. Um, but, but yeah, the, 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 I, I guess that the, the, the central thread is autonomy. That's what it's all about. It's about autonomy, and 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 that's really you know something quite central to to my thinking. You know, for, for well ever since I can remember, you know, autonomy is 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 fundamentally important, and, that, and that's certainly the case with the open source uh, software movement. But that, that's that's also got its roots in you know, cultures that, that sort of came previous to that. And, and, and certainly in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, that sort of fed into the open source, source culture uh, of, the, of, the, of the 70s, the late 70s and early 80s. So there's a lot of similarities, even though you can get some, you know, you know the diversity of understanding of what, what constitutes libertarianism is you know, quite different, in particular in the US, um, where, where the, right wing have basically appropriated the, the word libertarian. 
Mm. So, uh, so you mentioned the 70s just before with the movement onto the land mm -hmm. and then uh, and so those things might even go in parallel the, uh, the autonomy of that kind of being a small holder there is a exactly. lot of autonomy in uh, thinking in that idea isn't there well just look at the technology mm -hmm. we've got Starlink, basically autonomous internet basically uh, not reliant on, on any government uh, regulation. Yeah. Uh, if you've got, uh, and you can have internet anywhere, absolutely anywhere, a high speed internet, I'm talking about. So uh, then you've got energy. Um, you know, the, the, you know we've, we have the capability of building you know, small autonomous uh, uh, energy systems now, you know, that are quite affordable. You, know, you can set up a, a very respectable household system for say, I don't know, $15,000 uh, and, and be completely autonomous as far as uh, electrical energy is concerned. Heating energy is still a bit of a problem, but, but, but nonetheless, uh, all these technologies point to autonomy. Mm. It's interesting. I, 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 yeah. Is it, that, that, <laughs> Oh, Rupert, you, you know, I need your board with this because it's uh -huh. a real. It the the author, one of the authors of this book that speaks so much to this lib, lib, libertinism people, you know, where, yeah. the libertarians, mm -hmm. is the father of Riz Mock. Of mm -hmm. okay, yes. Well, like I said, you've got to be careful about people who call themselves libertarians. <laughs> yeah, I, clearly, I, I, I think yeah. it's isn't it always so? Like you know, there are the true maybe I would call them anarchists. Know so little about it, but still, mm -hmm. with who are all about mutual aid, like yeah. Kropotkin, and then there is others who uh, take that idea of self-organization and small is beautiful, and and are right-wing shits with it, as you say, and are yeah. just saying, ah, that's a bit of Thatcherism. Everyone for themselves here, yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. take as much yeah. as you as you get, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like perhaps more of the re-smog type, and mm -hmm. then you can see that whole movement and suddenly Brexit doesn't look so far-fetched. It actually, for the first time, makes sense to me how these mm. people come to those ideas. Mm. And yeah. that, that's that been quite a, like a, whoa, whoa, I hadn't seen that coming, you know? Yeah. Mm. I, I prefer to call myself a laissez-faire communist these days. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> gets, that, gets me out of that libertarian argument. <laughs> oh, in heck. Oh, anyway. Ooh. So, well, then, so we will see each other in the flesh and perhaps mm -hmm. cyber at the same time as yeah. well. Yeah. Sounds good. In, yeah. Well, if as much happens in the next fortnight, as this last one, who knows? Because <laughs> yes, it's quite a different world, isn't it? I think and it we is. Might not, we might not have internet if, if Putin does his thing. For it might not be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, think, I think it's possible. Yeah, it's pos certainly within the realm of pos probability. There is a probability. A high probability, hard, hard to say. But yeah, a probability nonetheless. Okay, just write down my address now and then just make it somehow. You know, you don't oh, okay. need an internet. Oh, okay, I'll send a carrier pigeon or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, oh my. Here we laugh. Who knows what's next? Huh? We got a pretty crazy mm -hmm. person yep. with a button. Well, on that jelly note, I'm going to go. <laughs> Hey. I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, yeah, see you again soon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we might well do it um, after my retreat, perhaps. See. Cool. Okay. okay. All right. Well, nice to meet up again and uh, yeah. see you soon.